Amen. So you may be seated. Thank you for standing. So well, we'll go we'll go through the whole chapter of uh, verse of chapter three of Joshua. Anyway, it's only seventeen verses. We still have uh, time for coffee later. Uh, but uh, we're we have uh, gone through two uh, messages, Joshua chapter one and two. And um, in chapter one, we saw how uh, how we should view the ministry of God, uh, how we should view the work of God, and how God views it, and how God gives importance to His ministry. And uh, we see we saw that as we uh, start on a new journey, just like these Israelites are going to start, it's very important to have the right perspective uh, in the work of the Lord. O- always uh, put in our minds, put in our hearts that the work that we're doing is the work of the Lord. It's not our work because as soon as we think that this is our work, as soon as we think that this is uh, uh, our own doing, then pride will come in and pride will be the one to eventually, the Bible says, it will destroy us. That's why we have to keep our eyes focused on the main thing, which is the Lord. It's not even about the work. It's not even uh, just about the, especially not about the minister, as we will still learn here in chapter 3, but it's about the God who, who uh, owns the work, because the work will continue uh, regardless of who is here and regardless of who's standing behind the pulpit or who's leading us in the work. So in chapter 2, we saw that uh, uh, how faith uh, works as well. Um, throughout this book of Joshua, faith uh, not just in the book of Joshua, in, in the Bible and even in our lives as uh, believers, faith has a lot to do with uh, uh, the things that we're, we're doing. Without faith, we will not be able to please God. Without faith, we will not be able to do um, anything that really will glorify the Lord. And if, if things we are doing, even uh, we think that we're doing for Him, if we're not, if we're doing it without faith, uh, it's not acceptable to God. But with faith, we can do things that are even uh, um, uh, great in the sight of man, especially great in the sight of God. Like Rahab, as we have seen in chapter 2, that even a harlot or a, a, a prostitute, even someone who, who uh, a community considers as the lowest of the low, the, 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 the worst person in the worst place, uh, uh, God can save, God can change, God can use mightily, through faith. That's why that is very important. Now, at the end of chapter 2, we have read that uh, last, um, uh, last week that the spies that Joshua sent to the land, they came back and then um, they gave the good report to Joshua. It's completely, and as I, uh, as we, as I read uh, Joshua, I'm sure that as you read Joshua, the book of Joshua, you can't help but compare what happens now and what happened before. Uh, no, because there's a lot of uh, similar, uh, similar uh, situations because they've been here before. They've been uh, at the edge of uh, 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 um, at the brink of entering or possessing the promised land. They've been here before and they're doing some of the same things but uh, the attitude is different. Uh, the results are different. Uh, the, the, the response of the people are different. That's why the last time that they sent uh, spies when they came back only Joshua and Caleb gave good reports. But this time the, the, the spies that Joshua sent came back and all in in, in unison gave a good report and saying, we must go. Let's go. Uh, The Lord has prepared this place for us. And and I'm sure that what Rahab did was a big factor in uh, in that report. Why? Because God is even saving someone there, using someone there to protect us. And that is a sign that the Lord is really there. He's going before us. And He's the one who's going to give us the land. Let us go. So here in chapter 3, they're going to start uh, 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 leaving where they are, going to the edge of uh, um, uh, the Jordan River, and they will start, and then they will, be, uh, they will start to receive the instructions from Joshua on what to do. Up until this point, no one has any idea what they're going to do. Right? All, 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 they, all they did was, even, even Joshua up until this point hasn't done anything yet. All he did was speak, encourage the people, uh, uh, God speak to him, and then he relays the messages to the people. Remember in chapter 1, they just finished mourning the death of Moses. And after that, Joshua, uh, God encouraged Joshua to be strong, be courageous. Why? Because there are things that you're going to do. And the things that I'm going to ask you to do, you need strength, you need courage. So Joshua stood up, told the people, uh, we're going to follow the Lord, we're going to obey the Lord, we're going to keep His word, uh, uh, um, wait for God's instructions. And up until now, here until chapter 3, they haven't done anything yet. They're just there, uh, uh, listening, waiting for the commandment of God. So now, Joshua told them in, in, in verse number 1 to stand up, 
let's go and let's go uh, 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 before the Jordan River and then of course all of them in their minds they know they're going to cross this river and yet I, I want us to see here I didn't give a message uh, a title to the message because they're very different uh, uh, principles that we can see here and hopefully one or two will be able to help you uh, uh, here especially um, it's a good thing that uh, I was put in Sunday school because it's not going to be preaching there's not going to be uh, so much uh, challenges or, 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 or all of those things but we're just going through the verse and see how we can apply it practically in their lives in our lives so they're now there about to start the journey something that is uh, f for me this is one very important uh, a point in the story of the Israelites. Why? They have crossed something before, the Red Sea. They have uh, left Egypt. Those are very important uh, events in their lives. But this is by far the most important event, the most important step they're going to take because finally, they are ready to obey the Lord to possess the promised land. And that is something very ironic because that land is a promised land. And God already has promised to them that the land will be theirs. And yet, for 40 years, for a very long, for a very long time, they have uh, um, created this irrational fear of the people in that land. They have created, yes, I'm sure that they've been dreaming of that land. They've been dreaming of what God has promised, but they didn't have that courage to possess it. So it is just like uh, 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 God saying, "Hey, here's your phone," but you're not daring to step forward and take a phone. So this, up, up until now, uh, until now, they are, now that they are ready to, okay, we'll obey the Lord. We know God promises this land. We know that this is God's covenant to us. We're now going to step in faith and, and conquer the land and possess the land. And last time, that's something that we have learned is that the Lord does promise us a lot of things. Um, we have even learning, been learning that in the book of Hebrews. The Lord has promised a lot of things, a lot of blessings in the life of a believer. And yet, it's up to us to be able to get those blessings. Of course, some blessings or promises of God are unconditional. But many, uh, as we can see here in this chapter, many blessings of God uh, or promises of God also depends on a premise, depends on what we'll do. It, it usually depends on our obedience. We need to obey to experience the blessing. We need to uh, uh, be in a, in a local church. We need to be obeying uh, the word of God. We need to be uh, continually uh, uh, to live by faith, to step in faith, to obey the will of God in our lives, to continue getting those promises and blessings because uh, for sure the, 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 the Christian life is a life full of blessings but, and yet we don't experience those, we don't claim those because we are afraid to obey the Lord. So for them up until now, Everything is unknown. All they know is that we're sitting here, we're just doing what Joshua is telling us, and we're just waiting for instructions. And, and immediately, let's, let's just look at uh, verse uh, number one. It says here, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. So again, let's con compare to the previous generation of Israelites. Remember when they were on the, uh, uh, in front of um, the Red Sea and they didn't know what to do. So they just escaped Egypt, uh, uh, Pharaoh is running after them and now there's this uh, body of water in front of them. They didn't have any boats, there's a lot of them. What are we going to do next? You know the previous generation complained. The previous generation asked Moses, what's your plan? What's next? What are we going to do? We don't have any boats, are we going to swim? Or, or, or did you just lead us out to, 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 to let us die out here? And I'm sure that there are people here right now in Joshua chapter 3 who are thinking, uh, what's next? Okay, uh, we're going to possess the land, but there's this body of water in front of us. Uh, the Bible says uh, in verse 15, we have read that this, uh, this is not simply a, a peaceful waters that we're about to cross. Because if you look even in, uh, uh, if you research and look at pictures of the Jordan River, it's a very peaceful river. And uh, you will think, right now if, if this is something that is that they had to cross it's no big deal but in verse 15 it, to, it told us that this is the time of year that one time of year that is a very dangerous river to cross so i'm sure that these people are thinking what's next what are we going to do I'm sure we have to cross this river but in chapter 1 verse 11 we saw that after joshua talked to them stood up joshua said pass through the holes and command the people saying prepare you victuals for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. So when, when Joshua gave them their first instruction, prepare yourselves, we're going to cross this Jordan and prepare food. 
There are more than a million people here, and yet Joshua didn't tell them to build boats or, 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 or uh, build something that we can use to cross this river. What Joshua told them was prepare something to eat. Prepare whatever you will need for the journey. And, and, and I'm sure these people are uh, even a, a little bit puzzled. What's next? And yet we see the complete difference in their attitude in the same circumstance that they're in. There's no complaining. No one was telling Joshua, what's next? Why don't you tell us the plan? We've been here for three days, and that you, you, have not, you have not said anything. How are we going to cross this? We're not even building anything. But, yeah, but, but again, we see the complete difference in their attitude. Because of people who are ready to follow the Lord, uh, uh, people who are ready to follow the Lord, people who are ready to step out in faith for the Lord, are, not, are people who do not complain. Do not complain about what God, they just sit there and wait. Sit there and wait for the instructions of God. And, and one thing that uh, uh, we can see, let's, let's read uh, verse number 2 to 4. Uh, and it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, and, uh, and about 2,000 cubits by measure, Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. So, now this is the first real instruction that Joshua is giving them. So after a few days, this is the first real instruction that Joshua is standing up, telling them specifically what to do. So now, these people, instead of complaining, they just sat there waiting and waiting for the Lord uh, uh, to give them instructions. Waiting for Joshua to give them instructions. And one principle that I want to uh, uh, see us to see here in verse 2 to 4, uh, actually verse number 1 to 4, what thing we can learn to from there is Joshua's message to them or maybe the Lord's message to us here is when we are there in that place in our lives where we are about to cross over for for me uh, uh, what we can see is we're about to go to a next chapter in our lives uh, we're about to make a decision that will change our lives forever and, and there, 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 are, there have been many decisions in our lives uh, 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 na yan. when we were teenagers we, meet, we made a lot of decisions that changed our lives forever uh, when we graduate high school we had to decide which course to take in college and that will uh, dramatically change the course of your life when you uh, graduate college you had to choose which uh, uh, which job and that would change your life uh, 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 from that point as well after that uh, you had to uh, decide for some of us at least whether I'm gonna get married or not and that is something that would definitely change your life and another life-changing decision is who am I gonna get married to uh, those those decisions and uh, when you get married how many kids do I want and then after that, when you, start, uh, when you start to have kids, then you slowly settle down. But God still uh, uh, places us always in a position where we have to make a decision uh, that would change our lives forever. And when that comes, for some of us here in Cambodia, that decision was whether I'm going to Cambodia or not. All right, so those are decisions that uh, you may say, I cannot, find the, uh, I cannot find a specific verse in the Bible for me to help me to decide. But one principle we can apply is, let us stay wherever God placed us until He's the one who tells us to move. Let's stay, right? So if God placed you here, uh, uh, here in Simrip, and you're sure that it's God who placed you here, don't move until it's God who's telling you clearly to move. And uh, that is a very tricky situation. You cannot read in the Bible, um, jo uh, uh, and, and, and the Lord said unto John, go to Thailand. You, you cannot read that in the Bible. That is a very tricky situation. And this can only be done, uh, or, or this can only result in the life of a person who's daily walking with God. Who's, who's practiced in his life uh, a life of obedience to whatever the Holy Spirit is leading him to do. Leading him or her to do. And then that's when we are sure if God is telling us to go. For them it was sure, you're going to move, you're going to start moving when you see this ark. Uh, 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 when you see the priest start moving the ark towards uh, crossing the river, then you start to move. But these people were not to move until then. They were not to move until they are sure that it's God who's telling them to move. And, and throughout the Bible, we can see that as a theme. Abraham went when God told him to go. 
right? And but the, the moment that God uh, told him, uh, uh, didn't tell him to go, and then he went instead going to Egypt. That's it, when it resulted uh, him committing sin and doing things that are not uh, uh, um, uh, according to the will of God. You know, Paul and his company throughout their uh, missionary journeys, they only went to places where they are sure that the Holy Spirit is leading them to go there. And, 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 and it even went to a, a time when they had, they, they had to return to a place where they almost died. And, and yet, they still return. Why? Because the Lord is leading them to that. It, they even came to a point where they want to go somewhere, but the Holy Spirit said, No, I'm not leading you to go there. Go here instead. You know, the life of a successful life of a, of a believer is, is, uh, is, is lived in the life of obedience to the will of God, obedience to the leading of God. And we don't go until and unless God tells us to go. And then even the Israelites, we can see early in the Old Testament, the Israelites, God provided for them a cloud by day, a fire by night, and they only moved when it moved. Right? So only go when God tells you to go. Only move when God tells you to move. Only do that when you're sure that it is the will of God in your life. Why? Because life is a, uh, uh, making big decisions in life should be something that uh, we don't take lightly. And it should be something that we ask God for, we pray for, we pray for it, we ask God for guidance, we ask God for, uh, uh, for, for His will in our lives. Because once we make a wrong decision, it may, it may be too late to change it. You know, as, as, as human beings, we, we, we uh, develop these different uh, signals on when to, when to move, when to do something. Uh, and most of the time, we base it on circumstances. Right? That's why you, what, uh, a lot of things you see uh, on, on Facebook and social media, those philosophies of this world is, I'm, I, I'll go because it's too difficult for me here and now. Or, or I'm not happy anymore. Or I'm not uh, 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 learning anymore. I, I've done all I can in this place, I have to go. And all of those reasons are self-serving. All of those reasons are directed uh, to what I want, what I feel, what I think uh, I need in this life, and God has nothing to do with that. And, 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 and funny enough, in the Bible, when things get difficult, rarely does God tell His people to move away. Right? Because uh, remember uh, when Abraham was, was, was continually o obeying the Lord? Uh, okay, Abraham, go to this place, start your journey. Then he starts his journey. But then when, uh, when he experienced a famine, that's when God doesn't tell him to go anywhere. Stay there. That is the place where, where, where I told you to be. And yet, he moved to Egypt. Right? Instead of obeying God to, uh, on staying there, and, and then we all know what happened to Egypt. Uh, in Egypt, he, he committed sin and all of those things uh, that he did. And, and, and even, even the people of God, uh, even Paul, when, even when, when, when things get difficult, rarely does God tell you to uh, move away from those circumstances. Why? Because God allows those difficulties in the place that God placed you in order to develop you, in order to, to, to make you more mature, in order to uh, make you a better Christian for Him. Rarely does God and remember uh, the Israelites when there was a famine God told them don't go to Moab and Elimelech uh, uh, took his family Naomi and his two sons to Moab anyway and that uh, uh, resulted in a lot of heartaches in the life of Naomi rarely contrary to our uh, uh, to our own thinking rarely does God tells his people to move when circumstances get difficult very rare. God wants us to endure that. God wants us to, to stay. God wants us to learn something in that circumstance, in that situation. That's why uh, um, let's not based, base our decision uh, on, on, on doing something based on our circumstances. No, God does use circumstances to develop us, but not to make deci life-changing decisions in the, middle of those, uh, in the middle of those circumstances. So uh, uh, rarely does God does that and today uh, we should still apply the same principle there, there's no cloud by day there's no fire by that there's no ark that we're waiting to move before we do something but we have the word of god today we have the bible and what how do we make sure that our decisions uh, uh, to do something are based on the word of uh, are, are based on the will of god we can find that in the word of god we can find it in the word of god there's nowhere else we can find it apart from the word of god and uh, even, yes, even the decision to get married, it's in the Word of God. Even the decision who to get married to, it's in the Word of God. Not a specific person, but God told us at least who not to marry. 
The Bible says, "Don't uh, be not unequal, unequally yoked with unbelievers." At least that we can see clearly in the Bible. And then we can see there that God wants us to 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 live a life that's pleasing to Him. So, uh, in principle, God wants us to marry someone who would uh, 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 serve God and glorify God together with us in our lives. So those principles are in the Bible, and we can see that, and we can use the Word of God to guide our every decision, especially those decisions who are uh, that will uh, change our lives. So, so, so Joshua told them, "All right, when you see this ark moving, the priest moving the ark, then that's when you start to move. So let's move only when God tells us to." But then, in verse number uh, three, I believe. There was verse number four. Yet yeah, there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. So uh, come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. So um, whenever uh, when I study this verse, it's, it's uh, fascinating that a lot of uh, commentators see. Uh, a lot of things in this verse, and uh, they read too much into it. But if you look at verse number three, it's a very practical command, saying that, okay, uh, um, keep space between you and that ark. 2,000 cubits is uh, almost one kilometer. So that means when, when it has moved one kilometer, then that's, that, then that's when you start. So Joshua's reason is very simple. He gave it in this verse says that so that you'll be able to see it. There's a mi more than a million of you. If you will crowd around the ark, not everyone will see where they have to go. So let it go, f let it go ahead of you so that you would know where to go. Why? Because you have not been here before. Right? Let the Lord guide your steps. You've not been here before. And when God does ask us to move, or when God does lead us to a place, He asks us to keep our eyes on Him. He asked us to keep our eyes on him. Why? Because, first of all, like what I can see here is because he's going before us. Most of the time, especially us who went to Cambodia, we didn't know what to expect. Right, when we decided, Lord, I'm going to Cambodia, nobody here know, knew what to expect of this place. But what we do know is God has already, he's already in this place and he's already been here. So the person who we should trust is a person who's already been there. Like if you go somewhere, you're a tourist, you trust the tour guide. But you don't trust yourself, you're going to get lost. You trust someone who lives there. And then when, well, but, but the same principle applies with the Lord. When God does lead you to go somewhere, you, we are sure that He has already been there, or He's already there, and He knows the next the steps that we need to take. That's why our eyes should be focused on Him. Kaya nga po, uh, uh, nag-decide na tayo sumunod, tapos gagawin lang natin sa sarili natin paraan, maliligaw din po tayo. That's why when we start to obey God, and then we start, we say yes to God. Lord, I will obey you wherever you lead us. Remember, that's, that's what the, uh, the tribes told Joshua. Wherever you tell us to go, we'll go. Whatever you tell us to do, we'll do. When you do say that to God, when you do commit, give that commitment to the Lord, commit everything and, 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 and uh, everything should be uh, dependent upon Him. You don't say, Lord, okay, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I'll do it my way. It doesn't work that way. Even the steps that we have to take, let the Lord be the one to guide us. Why, why, why do we have to keep our eyes on the Lord? Because He's the one moving before us. Not only that, because we're sure it's not going to be a smooth journey. When we decide to obey the Lord, we, we cannot expect a comfortable life. We cannot expect a life that is easy. For these people, that moment that they, they, they step foot on the Jordan River and then decided to, to possess the promised land, it's going to be battle after battle after battle. They're going to lose some people. It's not going to be an easy, uh, easy journey. And when we do obey the Lord, when we do ask, uh, when we do... Uh, decide to follow the Lord, be sure that it's not going to be a smooth journey. That's why it's very important to keep our eyes on the Lord. These people had to keep their eyes on the Lord. They, these people had to keep on relying upon, upon the Lord. We're going to face many battles. We're going to face many uh, uh, obstacles in, 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 uh, in our uh, um, uh, pursuit of the will of God. That's why I, I remember when, 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 I, uh, when I got to this point, I remember my uh, Bible school days. One of the... There are... Uh, advisors in the Bible school that would advise you in life. Uh, these are supposed to be the, the wise people in the world. So they, they know what you have to do. Uh, one thing I notice is that they all, all, almost only advise you when it comes to love life. Only that. They call you to the office. They, they talk to you because they're just advising you on uh, who to marry, who to, what, how to know who you have to get ma uh, married to. And one thing that they always say is that you will know that it's the person for you when everything is smooth. Uh, when you have no problem with their family, you have no problem with the pastor, you have no problem with 
this, we have no problem with that. And everything was, is smooth. That is the will of God for your life. And then they go on to tell their story of a very not smooth journey to marriage. And to me, it's very, uh, parabang napaka, 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 ano, hypocrite naman. Sabihin nila, pag okay ang lahat, yes, siya talaga ang para sa'yo. Tapos kikwento nila, alam mo, nung ako, ang dami ko talagang pinagdaanan sa nanay niya, ang dami ko talagang, bah, edi hindi will of God yung pinakasalan mo. Para bang, ang, ano mo sila, alam na, narinig mo ba yung sarili mo para sa akin? And, and a lot of times, when someone gives testimony, even in our Bible school there, every Sunday afternoon, we give testimonies, and then they say that, we know that it's the will of God because everything was smooth. Everything was taken care of. You know, if Paul applied that principle, he wouldn't do anything. Right? I would go to this place, but there's shipwreck. This is God telling me to go back. It's not smooth. Right? Uh, if, if, this is the, if, if the Israelites or Joshua applied this principle, well, the first city we have to conquer has these high walls. Uh, this is not the will of God. It has to be when we go there, everyone's dead already. We just have to uh, take the land. It's, it's not, the, the, the Bible rarely d- works that way. Um, God doesn't prepare everything smoothly for you and then you know that it's the will of God. The, the, the journey of faith or, or when we follow God, it's not going to be smooth. That's why we have to keep our eyes on God. We have to keep relying upon Him. That's why don't use that logic. And, and thankfully, I haven't heard that kind of testimony in this church only once. He's not here anymore. His name rhymes with Don. Ano po, minsan ko palang narinig yan. Uh, sa hapon, sinabi niya, ah, nung nilid ako ng Panginoon papunta dito, talaga pong lahat naging smooth. Eh. Nandiyan na po yung ticket, nandiyan na po. You know, hindi po yan ang prinsipyo ng Bible. That's not the way God works. It's not, uh, b- things being smooth is not a sign that it's the will of God. You know, it's, it, it's it, it, when you read the Bible, almost throughout the Bible, it's the complete opposite. There's always opposition, there's always uh, difficulties, there's always battles, there's always trials, there's always temptations, always all of those things. But one thing, uh, uh, for us to be sure that what we're doing is the will of God, it, if, is it, it is when we see that it is God's leading in our lives. That's it. And it, it, is, it is according to the Word of God, however difficult it is, as long as it is according to the will of God, then that is the, uh, uh, the lead or the will of God in our lives. So, when we do make that journey, when God is, is telling us to move, keep our eyes on Him. Just like these people, they're waiting for the commands of the Lord before they do anything. I don't do anything until and unless you're sure that it's God's command for you. Verse number 5 says, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow, tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now, Joshua didn't say what's going to happen. He just said, be ready. God will do something. Get ready. Prepare yourself. Sanctify yourself. This, this, uh, if, if, if you have been reading the Old Testament, you know that when, when, when Moses commanded them or Joshua commanded them to sanctify themselves, they have to wash with water, change their clothes, prepare themselves, even abstain from having sex with their spouse. Uh, because they they have to wait for this. God is going to do something through them or in front of them, so uh, so that they they're going to see the power of God. So Joshua said, "Prepare yourself. God is going to do something. You know, when God leads you to a place, God is going to accomplish something through you. Hindi ka din nila ng Panginoon sa isang lugar para wala lang. You know, God is going to accomplish th- something through you, but you do have to be ready." You do have to sanctify yourself. You do have to prepare yourself. In the New Testament, sanctifying ourselves doesn't mean we have to take a bath, change our clothes, and all these things. It means that we have to prepare our hearts. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. It means that we have to look inside and see whether we are ready to really obey the Lord. And that's when God will do something through us. But until unless we're ready uh, for that, the Lord will not use someone who's not ready. We cannot live uh, our whole lives as heathen people and expect God uh, the next day to, to make us the pastor of a huge church. It doesn't work that way. It works in a way that God will prepare you. God will sanctify you through the things that He allows in your life. And you looking in your heart, if you are uh, submissive to God uh, through all those things and you let God do His work in your life, that's when God will do something through you. So, so Joshua said, okay, prepare yourselves. God will do, uh, will do something uh, for us, for you tomorrow. You're going to see it tomorrow. I'm not, ge- I'm not telling you what it is now. You're going to see that tomorrow. Verse number 6, And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and pass over the people, before the people, and they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and went before the people. I will, we'll we'll, we'll uh, skip this verse for now. We'll go back later. Uh, because it, uh, it, it will um, solidify the point in, in, in the last part 
of this chapter. Verse number 7, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee, Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. One thing that we see here, God does magnify people in the eyes of other people. It is true. Because the reason why God magnifies people or lifts people up is also to use that person to help his people as well. So God said, I will magnify you, Joshua, in front of all these people. Just like what God did with Moses. Uh, 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 God made sure that these people know that Moses is your leader. I am with Moses. I am talking to him. Obey him. I will do that for you as well. Okay? God magnifies his uh, people for his purpose. The meaning of magnify simply means to make something uh, seem bigger. Right? Uh, of course, I'm sure all of us have used a magnifying glass before. When you use a magnifying glass to see something like an ant, it looks bigger, but it doesn't change the nature of the ant. It doesn't make the ant actually become bigger. It just makes the ant bigger in, in your eyes. So when it is God who magnifies someone, it doesn't change the person. I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I, I've made this point in chapter 1. When God lifts someone up, when God calls someone, when God promotes someone, when God magnifies someone, we know that it is God who did that. It is the work of God if it doesn't change the nature of the person. Right? If God lifts someone up and he becomes proud and he changes and then he, he takes control of everyone outside of the will of God, it's not God who magnified the person. Right? If it's God who magnifies the person, he will just make him seem bigger in the eyes of other people and yet he is the same person. And we see that in the, in the, in the, later on in, in, in the other versions of Joshua. So whenever God wants to, to whenever God magnifies someone, he, he magnifies people who are ready who are obedient to Him, who are faithfully obeying Him, and humbly obeying Him. And when God does magnify them, they will not, uh, hindi mo awala yung pagiging humble nila. Hindi mo awala yung pagiging obedient nila. Hindi mo awala yung pagiging faithful nila sa Panginoon. The Bible is clear. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, But He giveth more grace. Wherefore He saith, God resists the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Verse number 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, that He shall lift you up. So a person who's trying to lift himself up is someone that God will not lift up. The Bible is very clear there. One thing that we can see in this verse is what God is not saying. God is not telling Joshua, okay, Joshua, magnify yourself in front of these people. No, God said, I will begin to magnify you. This is not a concern of Joshua's. This is not, uh, hindi, you, you, you don't see Joshua telling, uh, uh, telling uh, God, Lord, uh, uh, you have to give me authority. Uh, you ha Lord, you have to tell them that I'm the leader. You have to tell them that I'm, I'm this, I'm that. They have to obey me. No, Joshua was just faithfully relaying God's message to the people. And now God said, Joshua, I'm going to magnify you in the, mil uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the midst of these people. Why? Because I'm going to use you for them as well. God doesn't magnify Joshua for Joshua's benefit, but God magnifies Joshua still for his glory and his, his benefit. That's why God's magnification will, uh, will, will just keep someone humble because he knows he magnifies people that, that he knows will use that uh, 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 new position, new influence, new resources in order to help the people of God also. But today, that's not the nature of the ministry anymore. Today, people magnify themselves. People magnify other people. They don't let God do the magnifying. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but the main faithful man who can find. Today, it's all about uh, what I did in the ministry. It's all about what I preached last Sunday. It's all about what I gave to the Lord. It's all about what God did through me. It's all about that. And no one is just waiting for God to be the one to magnify them in front of the people. And people are in a hurry to lift themselves up. And these people are not, uh, are not uh, people that, that God magnified. And, and even if you, uh, um, and you, know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about, it's very sickening. You, uh, you see a, lo uh, a lot of, uh, there's this one live video the other day where he's, uh, do, uh, I'm not, he's using the, vid uh, uh, the live, his, his, he went live on Facebook just to show that this certain pastor bought a, Merced a brand new Mercedes Benz for his wife, which is a good thing. If I have uh, money to buy my wife a car, I will not because I don't want her to drive. 
but I will buy her something else. Right? But it's a good thing. He bought now a Mercedes uh, Benz for his wife. But then throughout that live video, all you can hear is, this person deserves this. This person that. This person this. This person that. Right? It's sickening. Why? Because they're using the platform of the ministry of God to magnify themselves or other people. And if you really are a believer, if you really are someone who is uh, for the will of God, for the glory of God, it should sicken you. It should, it should not sit right with you. I'm not saying that you do something about it, but it should uh, do something in your heart that the Holy Spirit will say, this is not my will, this is not what I want these people to do. So, but if, if, it, if it doesn't affect you at all, then there's something wrong with you. Look at, look at Joshua. God telling Joshua, uh, I, will, I will magnify you. The reason why God magnifies people is to help people as well. Verse number 8 says here, And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark, of the covenant saying when you're come to the brink of the water jordan you shall stand still in uh in jordan and uh one thing that we can see here is if we put ourselves in the shoes of these priests god uh joshua told them go into that raging river go to the middle and stand there now if, if you are someone who doesn't have faith in god <laughs> there's no way i'm gonna do that there's no way go into the raging river and stand there Joshua doesn't even tell them what God will do. He just told them, go there and stand. Just go there and stand. We, we, we'll, go, we'll go back to this later. Let's, uh, uh, let's, let's uh, go to, uh, to our uh, next point. Uh, here in verse, we'll, we'll skip some verses. We'll go back to that. But let's go to this uh, message of Joshua to the people. Verse number 10. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hevites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. So here's my point. If God magnifies someone, that person will use that new position God placed him in in order to point people to God as well. Right? Joshua could have said, Look what God will do through me. Look, just wait and see. Stand there. God will do something because of me. God will do something through me. No, but God, God told Joshua, Okay, Joshua, I'm going to magnify you. I'm going to uh, place you in a pedestal. The people will look up to you. People will see you as someone who is big. People will see you as someone who they need to obey. And the next thing Joshua said, said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you. God, he used this uh, new place, this position, to tell people it's all God. God is going to do something. If you are in that place of Joshua, you're standing there, more than a million people are looking at you, waiting for you to tell them what's going to happen next. If pride creeps into your heart, you're going to say all, all very foolish things. Foolish things. Ah, tignan nyo mga yari. Tignan nyo mga yari. Pag yung mga priest na yan, uh, uh, nandun na sa uh, gitna ng river, tignan, titigil yung mga, yung pagda, pag, pagdaloy ng napaka, uh, ng, ng river na yan. Makita niyo yan. Because God, I obeyed God, because God did this, because you know, uh, I'm willing to give my life to God, God will do this for all of us. And you, you owe me. You owe me. You know, if, 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 if a certain pastor today, God will give this uh, kind of a command, I'm sure that's what they will say. But Joshua, uh, no nonsense with this guy. God will do something, wait for him, look, look to him, uh, wait for what, for what God will do. It's not me. Nothing about him. From chapter 1 up until here in chapter 3, whenever Joshua addresses the people, he doesn't say anything about him. He didn't even say, I'm your leader now. He just let the people know that through the working of God uh, 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 in the midst of them. Nothing at all. He said, Behold, uh, 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 you shall know that the living God is among you. Why? Because this is a daring task. Why? If he, points, if he starts pointing people to look to him, eventually these people are going to get discouraged. Just like the previous generation, they were looking at Moses. So they say, Moses, what to do now? So, but, so Joshua was saying, no, keep looking at to God. This is going to be a difficult task for you. But if you keep looking at God, if I keep pointing you to God, you're going to have enough faith to continue doing that. It's not about me. It's not because of me. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth before you into Jordan. Again, pointing people to the Lord. Now therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of the tribe every man. And it shall come to pass... 
now he's going to tell them what's going to happen. As soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon an heap. Verse number 14. And it shall come to pass when the people remove from their tents to pass over Jordan, the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped, in the brim of the water, here we can see, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest. It is, isn't it, uh, uh, isn't it, uh, um, doesn't it uh, uh, stir your mind that why does God choose the worst time possible to ask the people to cross Jordan? Right. As I have said, if, even if you go through Google images.google.com and then you type Jordan River, it's a very simple river to cross. You say, oh, what's the big deal? Bakit kailangan pa ng miracle? Parang simple lang naman. Even, uh, uh, even in uh, uh, some preachings that you, uh, 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 or testimonies of people who've been there, it's nothing special crossing this river. But God chose that one time of year during this time to ask His people to cross the river when it's uncrossable. Especially so without boats. Especially so when they're just going by foot. God chose this time simply because, I don't know about you, but if you read the Bible, God has this flair for these things. Uh, he likes the dramatic. He, he likes, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that in a, in a way that oh, God is a proud God, but God does things in a way that will really uh, make sure that in the eyes of the people, it's only God who's doing this, no one else. No one else. Remember the Red Sea, the same thing. Uh, Moses couldn't have parted that Red Sea. They couldn't have praised Moses for that. There's only one person to praise for that, and that is God. Uh, remember when, uh, when, when uh, Peter was in prison? God, if, if that is a movie, it's going to be a great movie. He was heavily guarded with guards with him there, guards on the, uh, the first gate, guards on the next gate. But then God chose to, uh, uh, um, to, uh, to free him from the prison in the middle of the night, saying, stand, walk right out. Walk right out. Not, uh, uh, para bang napaka, well, hindi man sila nagising. Yung mga guard, hindi man nila napansin, na nakaalis na, pagising nila, basta wala na. You know, these things are, these miraculous things God does just to make sure that it is Him. And God did that in the middle of, of a moment when the, the church is praying, Lord, please uh, help Peter get, get, uh, get out of prison. Help, help him do something about it, Lord, please. And then while they're praying, He was already knocking. Right, that's a great movie if someone would just do something about it. It's already there. God already answered your prayer. I remember uh, uh, when, when uh, 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 these Israelites were battling a, a, certain, uh, 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 a certain army, God uh, made the sun stand still longer. Right? God does something in ways where it's unmistakable that it's His doing. Because if God told them to cross the Jordan River when it's very safe to cross, then uh, wala lang. Diba? They will not even be dis encouraged to fight uh, the, the city that they're going to fight without God showing them that. So God does that in order to show people that, hey, I'm going to do something and it's going to be unmistakable. It's going to be me doing it. That's why if God is making you do something or telling you to do something in a very bad time or, or something that makes it almost impossible, I think we can say that... Uh, it's really God who's telling me. Why? Because God uses these impossible situations to show us that He is God, the God of everything going to be possible with Him. Kaya nga, kung hindi lang din, ganun ang ginawa ng Panginoon, wala lang. What if Joshua said, Alright, uh, behold, we're going to be able to cross this very short river. Praise the Lord. Wala. Diba? But if this river is raging, if this river is impossible to cross, and they see the ark of the Lord standing there in the middle of the river, and then we can see here that the, the rivers, uh, the, the flow of the water stopped for 16 miles away. To Miguel, parang overnight gumawa ang Panginoon ng dam to stop the flow of that river. No, that is something that they will not say, oh, Joshua is so good. No, they will never say that. It's unmistakable. God is the one who did this. God is the one who did that. And through this, uh, through this event that God, uh, that, that, that God did in the sight of, uh, of the people, God magnified Joshua. 
confirm to the people that Joshua is the one that I'm going to use uh, 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 throughout this journey of possessing the land and I'm going to be there with you every step of the way. It's me. I'm going to do everything for you. And, and throughout the story of Joshua, uh, 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 impossible things, after impossible things, after impossible things, God will ask them to do ridiculous things. Right? You know, how many times have you read in the Bible that God asks His people to do ridiculous things? Oh, there's a big uh, walled city. Okay, march around it. And then I'll, I'll give it to you. God called Gideon. They had to uh, defeat hundreds of thousands of enemies with only 300. And God said, okay, you don't have to train. You don't have to do this. Just bring uh, trumpets and pictures and a lamp. Oh, those ridiculous things that you will, not, you will not mistaken the hand of God in, in, in all of those situations. So what, what, what happened here in, in, in Joshua chapter 3 before they enter that promise and before they take that first step into possessing, into claiming, um, into claiming that promise of God for them. There's a lot of things that happen. And, and we see this chapter as a very short chapter. But God used this moment in order to prove to the people that, yes, what I'm asking you to do may be daunting. Yes, what I'm asking you to do may be something that is very fearful in your mind. Remember, for many years, they have developed this irrational fear of that there are giants on the other side of that river. There are huge cities. There are people who we cannot or in no way defeat. You know, the, the, remember the spies, they told them that in their eyes, we're only grasshoppers. We're going to die. I, we're surely gonna, It's a suicide mission. But then, through the eyes of faith, when they do decide to use their faith or trust God, they, they're now going to realize that these are irrational fears. These fears that, 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 that they have is not, uh, is, is in the eyes of God is simply very different. And if you have been, uh, ito na po yung cue para ipasok ko yung, yung uh, programa natin every morning. If you've been watching our uh, program every morning do sa in, in Everything Bible page, you can see that the things that we see as impossible is just our perspective. Uh, because we're looking at it without God's uh, point of view without God's wisdom. Okay? That's why God to told us in James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom. Right? That is my life verse. And it's really, really interesting to see that uh, it's next to Philippians 4.13. It's one of the most abused verse. Because I'm not saying that it's wrong to apply that verse in every situation that we need wisdom. But that verse is given in the time of trials. So when, when, when James was say, telling the, the, the people, the scattered people, to, to uh, if any of you lack wisdom, James is simply saying, in the midst of trial, what you see around you are impossibilities. But that wisdom will give you God's perspective in the middle of those circumstances. So these people, they're crossing the Jordan River, or, or they're, not, they're not willing to cross the river because they're afraid. That is their point of view. But in God's perspective, those enemies are small. Those enemies are nothing. I can defeat them, just trust me. Same thing with David. Goliath may be big, but he's nothing. If you're just going to see it through my eyes, if you're just going to use the wisdom I'm, I'm giving you, it's nothing. Just keep on trusting the Lord. I don't know what God had called you to do for him today. I don't know what you have committed to the Lord to follow uh, uh, him. Maybe it's uh, uh, commitment. Maybe God is calling you to go someplace else. Maybe God is calling you to start a ministry. Maybe God is calling you to, uh, to be a pastor or to, to, to uh, serve God in the church with more capacity. And I'm sure that the reason why you're still not doing it is because uh, there's fear in your heart. There's fear of the unknown because I don't know what's going to happen. But let me tell you, God's calling is God's enablement. Right? God's leading is, means that God has already been there. When God calls you, that means be sure that He will enable you. Do not be afraid. Why? Because it is God who will go before us, it's God who is going with us, and it's God who will help us through all of these things. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for uh, this uh, Sunday school we had.